Our next speaker is uh, Dorothea Dickerman. And Dorothea uh, is a JD. She started asking questions um, whether Will of Stratford really wrote the Shakespeare canon when she was just 10 years old. She wrote, uh, she, after graduating from Amherst College, um, summa cum laude, and the University of Chicago Law School, uh, she became a partner in a major law firm structuring real estate deals. She recently retired from law to research and write about the life of Oxford, hoping to answer her childhood question. Her talk today describes a thoroughly researched trip to Italy with her Harvard Law School educated husband, seeking to convince him that Oxford was the real bard. The title of her talk is, The First Thing We Do, Let's Convince All the Lawyers. Welcome, Dorothea. Thank you. Let's see if we can get a screen share here. Okay. Yes. Uh, you know the quote, the first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. Sounds tempting, doesn't it? But I'm a lawyer and my husband, Rich, is an amazing lawyer. Princeton, Harvard Law School, partner in a major law firm, law professor, getting his master's in history, not a flat earther. Lawyers are annoying. We each think we're the smartest person in the room. So how do you convince opposing counsel that he's wrong? Especially when you live with him and you've been arguing about the Shakespeare authorship question for decades. Lawyers are particularly aware of the wide gulf between facts and opinions. We get allergic reactions to statement of fact that contain words like would have, could have, should have, must have, and undoubtedly did. And the lore on the man from Stratford overflows with such phrases. But to Rich, the name on the first folio was proof. He did not want to hear from me about the yawning chasm between the facts about Will and the Shakespeare canon's text. Now, he and I both know that in a court of law, Direct and circumstantial evidence can be used to determine fact. Direct evidence comes from a person who saw, heard, or touched the object or situation at issue. Circumstantial or indirect evidence proves facts based on other facts or circumstances. Rich claimed that only direct evidence could change his mind, like the plays in Oxford's hand, or for that matter, in Willis Stratford's hand, Assuming that Will could write more than his name, unlike his parents, his wife, and his adult children. The search has continued for centuries, but no plays, poems, notes, or letters exist in Willis Stratford's hand. And thus, we have no direct evidence that he wrote the plays either. I could walk you through Rich's objections and my responses, but trust me, I tried everything. We were at impasse. Finally, Rich admitted that the lawyer's identity did not matter to him. Although acknowledging the Bard's reputation, Rich found the canon uninteresting, except the history plays, because they transported him back in time, like to the field at Agincourt. It struck me that he did not realize that the entire canon is an eyewitness tutor history lesson with real people the Bard knew as characters. Maybe I could convince this lawyer Stratfordians admit their man never left England. If I could show that only someone with direct personal experience of Italy could have written those plays, Rich might see that the bard could not be Stratford's will. Then, if I could match heaps of Oxford's unique experiences and relationships in Italy to the plays, Rich might realize by circumstantial evidence that the bard is Oxford writing about his own life. Darling, this lawyer, Richard Rowe, says in the Shakespeare Guide to Italy that 15 of the 38 plays are set there. Let's go find the actual places in the plays and see if Rowe's right, say Milan, Mantua, Verona, Padua, Venice. The distance between being a lawyer and a storyteller is insignificant. Whether in the courtroom or the court of public opinion, law is critical storytelling. We had traveled in Italy many times, but on this trip, I went armed with Roe, my bard targeted itinerary, the plays, and an armful of historical research, much of it in Italian. Andiamo, Italia. Oxford's route from London to Italy began in early February 1575 on the well worn road through Canterbury to Dover, and there crossed the Channel to Calais. 
He was to represent his queen in Paris and Clem at Henri III's wedding and coronation as King of France. Henri had toured Northern Italy the previous year and gave Oxford letters of introduction. During his six weeks in France, besides Henri, Oxford met other French royals who appear in the canon, including Henri's brother, the Duc de Alessand, a suitor to Queen Elizabeth. To wait out the deep snow, Oxford visited Johann Sturmius in Strasbourg, and in April, he sailed up the Rhine to Basel and crossed the Alps using one of two routes. The first, via the St. Goddard Pass, would point him towards Milan. The other is the Venetian trade route, sailing Lake Constance in the Inn River to Innsbruck, and then, as 90% of travelers did, using the Lower Brenner Pass to the Adige, and then south on the Mincio, directly for Mantua. I favor the second route, avoiding Spanish-controlled Milan. Even if longer by distance, travel by water is easier and safer, and Milan had virulent plague in 1575. Oxford wrote he dared not pass by Milan. What makes sense to me is that King Henri contacted his Italian traveling companion, the musical Duke of Mantua, Guglielmo Gonzaga, also newly Duke of Montferrat. Guglielmo invited Oxford, an excellent musician, to Mantua. We will visit Mantua and the Gonzaga shortly, but Rich and I went first to Milan. A few historical reminders about 1575 Italy. A peninsula named Italy existed then, but no country till 1861. Wealthy warlord families like the Sforzas of Milan, the Gonzagas of Mantua, and the Scaligi of Verona, whose leaders are prince or duke in the Italian plays, held a patchwork of fiefdoms. Spain owned Milan and Naples, making them hostile to England. Venice, with the Veneto, was an independent republic. The Pope ruled the Papal States and Rome, and England sought allies against Spain, and neither the fiefdoms nor the Venetians wanted to become another Spanish colony. But like squabbling siblings forced to unite, Rome, Venice, and the Papal States had allied as the Holy League and defeated the Ottomans at Lepanto four years before Oxford arrived. I explained to Rich that Stratfordians conveniently dismiss major clues that Will of Stratford wasn't the bard by labeling them his mistakes. For example, the references in Two Gentlemen of Verona, The Tempest, and Taming of the Shrew to sailing on tides and floods and ships and barks between Milan, Padua, and Verona are mistakes because he thought those places were coastal. This Italian map disputes that conclusion, showing hill fortresses throughout Northern Italy connected by navigable waterways. Ucentars and Berchiellos ferried Isabel de Est and Lucrezia Borgia as far east as Venice. If you could afford it, and Oxford could. Barges under sail or tow were the way to go. Two maps of the center of old Milan, one modern, one Renaissance. At 11 o'clock on the modern map, in a green space labeled Parco Sempione is the Sforza Palace. The public gardens are at one o'clock. We will focus on the area between these two parks along the north perimeter of the old city where the action at the end of Two Gentlemen occurs. The bard describes that area's physical features precisely but mentions nothing else specific about the rest, the rest of Milan. Given that, the plague and Spanish rule, it seems to me that Oxford sailed by this north perimeter but never entered Milan. Like most Milanese canals, the outer and inner ring canals, the Naviglio Grande and the Naviglio Interno are now streets. Although it appears landlocked, Renaissance Milan, like most Northern Italian cities, had walls with gates and connected to other cities and the sea through canals and rivers. That canal water doesn't disappear. It has to go someplace. Rowe wrote that the Naviglio Martesana, which enters old Milan at its north perimeter, and connects the ring canals to the Ada and the Tincio, runs under the Via Melechioi Gioia. Rich and I walked north on it between the two parks to see. We were rewarded with the green gorgeous Martesana Canal gushing through a grill to meet its ancient bed under our feet. Completed in 1573, you can sail on it today to Milan, as did the two gentlemen from Verona and probably the Earl of Oxford departing Italy for England. Exploring the Milan canals showed Rich that Roe was right and Stratfordians not right, but it didn't prove who wrote the plays. I needed more evidence. Fortunately, my husband is endlessly fascinated by the plague. 
During the 1575 plague, the infected Milanese were consigned to live or die in the Lazaretto, a high walled city of the diseased, located outside the public gardens and the Naviglio Martisana. This drawing shows the Lazaretto with the little churches of San Carlo at its center and San Gregorio just outside its walls. San Carlo, then an open-sided octagonal chapel to allow the 16,000 sufferers to receive mass, was replaced later with a new church, now at the center of a beautiful residential neighborhood built right over the demolished plague-infested Lazaretto. While we watched the Lazaretto's 10-block perimeter, I told Rich the plot of two gentlemen. Boyhood friends, Valentine and Proteus, sail from Verona to Milan to be presented to the emperor in 1533, when the real Holy Roman Emperor Charles V held court at Milan. They both fall for fair Silvia, the Duke of Milan's daughter. Proteus betrays Valentine, who is banished. Then, realizing one Thurio is also courting Silvia, Proteus says, I'll quickly cross by some sly trick, blunt Thurio's dull proceeding, and lures him at night to St. Gregory's well. Rowe identified St. Gregory's well as the huge pit for dead plague victims in San Gregorio's courtyard. Researching in Italian, I found Renaissance maps and paintings of piles of bodies carted from the Lazaretto to San Gregorio through Il Porto Brutto and dumped into pits. It was clear to me that the bard experienced the horrors of the Lazaretto and St. Gregory's pit, probably by sight, sound, and smell from the Naviglio Martisana. Rich said, I'd heard of the Milan Maseretto. You all laid the groundwork from that play and you expanded it with Italian resources. Impressive. Several scenes in Two Gentlemen are set outside the Sforza Palace. Like Milan's historic Dukes, Pro Prospero and Miranda lived there before the Tempest begins. Can you picture how father and daughter were hurried aboard a bark on the Ring Canals? Born some leagues to the sea, to the Tyrrhenian Sea on the Pavese Canal, which exists today where they prepared a rotten carcass of a butt and sent to ride down the waves to an island. That's a tale from another bard targeted trip. Mantua's claim to Shakespearean fame is Romeo's banishment there from Verona. Roe wrote little about Mantua, but I thought the magnificent Palazzo Te was on the bard's trail. It was designed and decorated as a summer residence in addition to the Palazzo Ducale for Guglielmo Gonzaga's father, Federico by Giulio Romano the only artist the bard mentions by name. In The Winter's Tale, the anonymous third gentleman describes the dead queen Romione's statue as newly performed by that rare Italian master Giulio Romano, who had he himself eternity and could put breath into his work would beguile nature of her custom. Okay, who's Giulio Romano, Rich asked. Raffaello's best apprentice, heir to his studio and paintings in Rome, including Raffaello's portrait of Baldessare Castiglione. Oxford was such a fan of Castiglione's Book of the Courtier that he financed a Latin translation in 1572. Romano also sculpted tombs for a few important Mantuan citizens, among them Piezo Strozzi and Castiglione, whose mother was a Gonzaga. Oxford's Italian travels and his admiration of Castiglione were well known in England. Most travelers returning from Mantua praise Romano's frescoes and architecture. Praising his rare tombs instead means the bard was bragging. In the play's most dramatic moment, the bard upstages Romano by achieving what he says Romano could not. He puts actual breath into his work through an actress as Hermione's painted funerary statue comes to life and speaks his line. Romano decorated the sunny rooms in Palazzo Te with startling frescoes, mostly based on Ovid's metamorphoses, tales familiar to Oxford and the Bard. The most startling cover walls, floor, and ceiling in the dim room of the giants. In Ovid's tale, the rebellious giants heaped up hills to reign as gods, but Romano's version reflects Canto 31 of Dante's Inferno, a fog-soaked cyclorama of destruction resulting from the giant's rage encircles the vortex pattern on the floor, spiraling down to the night circle of hell. Rounded corners enhance the illusion of a roof ripped off to reveal Jove menacing from the heavens. Like Dante and Virgil, we stand outside the circular walls, amazed at the scene like this from King John. 
This tempest startles mine eyes and makes me more amazed than had I seen the vaulty top of heaven figured quite o'er with burning meteors. Commend these waters to those that never saw the giant world enraged. The bard read or experienced some version of the giant's rebellion much more violent and memorable than Ovid's pile of hills. Dante's Inferno was not translated into English until 1782. Ovid's Metamorphoses was also the undisputed source for the hilarious production of the tragic Pyramus and Thisbe, performed for Duke Theseus, Duchess Hippolyta, and the Athenian lords and ladies after they wedded the temple, but before the Bergamask, a rustic dance from Bergamo. We are in Athens with Athenians in a Midsummer Night's Dream, or so the bard tells us, 34 times, often repeatedly in a single line and with references to Apollo, Daphne, Cadmus, Crete, Sparta, and Thessaly. But what about the references to Roman mythology? Venus, Cupid, Neptune, Hercules, Aurora, Jove, and the Latin phrases. And what about the Duke, the Duchess, nuns, cloisters, knights, coats of arms, heraldry, San Valentino, and that dance from Bergamo? Sounds more like Italy. Where are we in this play? 25 miles southwest of Mantua lies Sabinetta, in Oxford's time, a medieval walled town, the Guglielmo's distant cousin, Duke Vespasiana Gonzaga Colonna, reconstructed into his ideal city. Rowe proposed Sabinetta as the setting for midsummer, claiming the city was known as Little Athens. I told Rich I had no idea whether Rowe was right. 18th century scholars spread the city's name, Little Athens of the Po. Today, you can find Little Athens on the Sabinetta soccer team logo. But what proves that Sabinetta was associated with Athens in 1575 or that Midsummer was set there? Sabinetta's only gate in its impressive medieval walls bears a plaque honoring its duke. But at the oak part of Rowe's description of that gate as the duke's oak where the players meet, I could find no clue. Rich was clearly not impressed with it or my explanation that the play's fairy world reflected the English court with Titania as Queen Elizabeth doting on the Duc de Alessan as bottom in Asses years. During our visit, evidence supporting Rose naming this octagonal church of the coronation as the temple where the couples read also eluded me. Later, I found blogs in which Sabinetta residents call this church Il Tempio del Il Coronato. So Tempio may mean chiesa or church in the local dialect. The town's roots are Roman. Just before we left, I wandered towards the center column in the large piazza, and there she was. Roe had not mentioned the full-size statue on top of that column. Although moved to the piazza in 1584, Athena had been the patron goddess of her little Athens since 1527, when Vespasiano's father brought her back from the sack of Rome. Perhaps little Athens in Italy with its thick brick walls, statue of Athena and temple provided theatrical camouflage for the queen's flirtation sufficient to pretend it was all a dream. What author could survive putting his queen on stage stroking the buffoonish Hercule Francois, the Duke of Alençon, in ass's ears, who boasts he could play Hercule and addresses her attendants as Mao Monsieur? Well, Maybe Oberon, King of the Fairies could, but certainly not Will of Stratford. In Renaissance Italy, avenging spilt blood was a familial duty. Authority Spanish defenders regularly and seized their goods. Today, in Verona, Juliet's house draws droves of paying foreigners visit visitors daily. An entryway festooned in lover's graffiti, a trinketeria, a pasted on Juliet balcony, although there's no balcony in the play. Italians say, that like some other famous historic houses, it's a fake. The house marked as Romeo's is closed to tourists. What caught Rich's attention was the graveyard of the Della Scala family. There, he told me about the Della Scalas who ruled Verona in the 14th century when the Veronese say the immortalized lovers died. I mentioned the family members are called Gliscaligeri in Italian. Aeschylus is Prince of Verona in the play, as well as a character and the first word in Measure for Measure. One of Oxford's lesser titles was Lord of Aeschylus. Sounds like the bard used Oxford's name in these two plays. Ten miles southwest is Verona's Villa Franca, identified by Roe as the free town in Prince Aeschylus' speech. Montague, come you this afternoon to know our farther pleasure in this case, to old Freetown 
our common judgment place. A fortified giant capable of holding multiple other castles within its walls, and now a public festival park, Old Freetown was constructed in the 12th century by the Scaligeri, so old by the 14th, to intimidate a subject and lay down the law, compounding him to Villafranca would do it. This is important because it is different than the earlier versions of Romeo and Juliet's story. The English version, a poem published in 1562, before Willow Stratford was born, called The Tragical History of Romeo and Juliet, is the undisputed source for the bard. Scholars debate whether its author, A.R. period, B.R. period, identified at some point as an Arthur Brook, translated it from French or Italian. Brook says he saw it set forth on the stage. Master Brook's biography is sparse. Anne Arthur Brook was admitted to the Inner Temple. Anne Arthur Brook died by drowning in 1563. Romeus and Juliet was not a great poem. Preachy, over-emotional, over-detailed, well, except if you were, say, 12 years old, and in Brooks' words, commanded to write it by she whose hest I must obey. Wow, only one she that could be. Brooke tells us the poem is his first and youthful work, with more to follow when time gives strength. Brooke's apprehension writing the 3,020 line poem on royal command is evident in the first excerpt on your screen, which reads a lot like the second excerpt from another poem, The Loss of My Good Name, written by E.O. Edward Oxenford, sometime between, before 1576, most likely in 1563, when he was 13, and his half-sister sued to have him declared a bastard. Why the similarity between the poems? Maybe Oxford knew Brooks' work and copied a section stylistically, or maybe Oxford wrote both poems penning Romeo and Juliet at age 12 under a pseudonym as noble authors customarily did. Due to his father's death, 1562 was the year Oxford became the Queen's ward by law, subject to obey her command and hest. Brooke, unaware of its size, called Freetown Verona the Capulet's country house. The bard fully adopted Brooke's tales and characters and yet somehow knew to correct that mistake and properly identified it as the Scaligeri Intimidation and Judicial Center. Like Petruchio and Caterina, Rich and I resumed our authorship debate on the road to Padua. Oxford took the Brenta Canal. In November 1575, he wrote to William Cecil from Padua and he orated there an indication his Latin and Italian were excellent considering the renowned University of Padua. Rowe tried to locate the Taming of the Shrew's first Padua scene using geographic clues from the play. Chiesa San Luca, the parish church where Kate and Petruchio marry, a nearby canal, a but bridge and inn. But what most modern audiences experience is really the play within the play. Without common textual cuts, Taming opens in England, not in Padua, an English lord resembling Oxford with his troop of actors tricks Christopher Sly, a drunk tinker, into believing he is the lord watching the play set in Padua. Sly comments on the Italian action occasionally. In the play, similar, an anonymous precursor called The Taming of a Shrew, the confused tinker asks, am I not Don Cristo Ver, Re? Besides Oxford's name slipped in again for laughs, the Bard's Taming contains an Italian geography lesson. People and goods hail from Padua, Mantua, Verona, Florence, Naples, Pisa, Venice, Bergamo, and Chem. Sounds like our Bard is boasting of his knowledge of Italy again. But why Chem? Rem is in France. Other English nobles traveled to Paris and Italy, but only Oxford had the honor of attending King Henri's coronation and wedding at Chem before traveling to the Italian cities listed in Taming. Circumstantial evidence? Sure, but you have to admit it's piling up. In Belmont is a lady richly left and she's fair. So Bassanio describes Portia to his kinsman, the merchant of Venice. Portia lives in an idyllic palazzo in Belmont. Stradbordians claim Belmont is a fictional place. It was a fictional Adriatic port. In the 1588 source for the play, called Il Pecorone by Giovanni Fiorentino. But Roe and others, using three geographic clues in the Bard's version, 
in and on the banks of the brown wide Brenta Canal, 10 miles west of Venice as Villa Foscari Malcontenta. In the Bard's Belmont, Portia's waiting woman Nerissa asks her, do you not remember a Venetian that came hither in the company of the Marquis of Montferrat? In July, 1574, the Foscari family used Villa Malcontenta, designed by Andrea Palladio, to entertain Oxford's new acquaintances, King Henri of France and Guglielmo Gonzaga, Duke of Mantua and Marquis of Montferrat. Henri's introducing Oxford to Guglielmo likely procured Oxford his invitations to the Palazzo Te and Savignetta and from the Foscari to Villa Malcontenta. What other Englishman could boast of such connections? In Merchant, by using Guglielmo's lesser title of Marquis, the bard demonstrates his insider knowledge. Guglielmo was elevated from Marquis to Duke of Montferrat in 1574, the year he and Henri visited Villa Malcontenta. In May, Oxford settled into the richest and most splendid city in Europe until the plague arrived and he left to tour the peninsula, returning in September. Il Pecorone was not translated into English until 1632, after both Oxford and Will of Stratford were dead. It contains the lady at Belmont, three caskets, the Venetian merchant financing a lovesick relative, the Jewish lender, the pound of flesh, the lady disguised as a lawyer, and the missing ring, all also in the board's version. To Il Pecorone, which he could only have read in Italian, what does the bard add that only someone very familiar with Venice would know? Plenty, but this is what impressed Rich. Spending and borrowing prodigiously, as his letters indicate, Oxford likely knew the Rialto Campo, the Venetian banking center mentioned five times in the bard's play and not at all in Il Pecorone. Rowe names his 1541 statue located there called Il Gobo, the hunchback, as the source for Shylock's servant's name based on the Riverside Shakespeare and other modern additions, calling him Lancelot Gobo and his father, who carries a basket on his back, Old Gobo. While Old Gobo's name may have come from the statue, the sons did not. Lancelot Gobo is a modern editorial change from the first folio's Lancelot Jobe. Jobe in Italian means Job, from the Bible's book of Job, not a hunchback, but the Gentile prophet, whom the devil robbed of family and wealth exactly Shylock's fate. To understand Jobe when he says he serves the devil or the fiend is at my elbow, we need to know Italian like the bard and know that the church of San Jobe is located near the Jewish ghetto. Protection of Venice's wealth dependent on its warships which could be constructed in the arsenale and one day from prefabricated parts. Venetians regarded their arsenale as top secret and posted guards on its two miles of ramparts. In Merchant, the bar displays impressive knowledge about Venetian merchant ships, foreign ships, trade routes, hazards, and in Othello about warships. The Venetians surrendered Cyprus to the Turks in 1570 after 11 months of siege. The Turks slaughtered every inhabitant. In retaliation, the Holy League annihilated the Turkish Armada at Lepanto, a victory memorialized in the Doge's palace. No English translation of Othello's source, an Italian novella by Giovanni Giraldi, existed in Will of Stratford's lifetime. In the Bard's version, instead of surrender, under Othello's command, the island is saved, in part by a storm that destroys the Spanish Armada. Yes, I said the Spanish Armada. The Bard uses foreign locations to tell contemporary English history. In Othello, the bard reveals knowledge of sea battles. Oxford personally fought the Armada at sea, which is the battle and the victory described in Othello. The bard singles out one warship. The third gentleman in the first folios Othello describes the damage that noble ship caused the enemy. And then the ship is here put in, a V-E-R-E -E Veronessa. Starting in the early 1700s, Stratfordian editors have struggled with the word Veronessa, substituting Veronesso, Veronessa, and Veronesa. Isn't it obvious why the bard chose Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford's name, to describe this ship? 
On our last evening in Venice, I asked Rich, have I convinced you that Oxford wrote the Shakespeare canon? I don't have enough information, he responded, but there is no way Willis Stratford wrote it. No one could have that level of detail about that many places in Italy unless he had been here himself. So I won the battle and I had a plan to win the entire war with a trip to Sicily. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Dorothea, for your wonderful talk on your trip to Italy and uh, your attempt to convince your lawyer husband uh, regarding the authorship. Many people commented in the Q&A section um, that your photographs were beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing them with us.